Welcome, everyone. We are in shutdown still, but fortunately, we have this 8 by 8 conference call with Alberto Stocchino of Perceptive Sensing AI. Did I get that right, Alberto? Correct. I okay. okay. Excellent. It's very perceptive of you uh, to have such an interesting name. And, and what you're doing is really bringing a, um, a new approach to, to sensing for autonomous vehicles, and it's a simplified approach. Why don't you describe what makes it different than the traditional method where you have uh, intelligence at the edge, if you will? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look historically, basically the past 15 years, um, what we call like first generation autonomy, we uh, tried and built upon an approach or an architecture for sensing that were developed in the, in the 2000s for the early R&D days of autonomy, right? Um, throughout this time, so the field mature, and now sort of we started thinking about commercial commercialization, right? And turning this R&D platforms into true products. So, and it, it turns out it's a very different problem, right? Uh, so capabilities and scalability uh, today are not quite there yet. And so there is no much room for the existing systems to actually scale, you know, improve on that direction. So we, we decided like a major overhaul of the sensing platform was needed. It was pretty clear and it's clear to everyone. Um, and so we, we looked at, you know, basically the key, uh, you know, um, limitations of, of the current platforms in terms of like capability, as I mentioned, and, and scalability. Um, so performance are not quite there. Um, and because the, the fundamentals of the uh, sensing principles that the existing systems today use, they're now just um, intended to actually reach the level of performance that we require. And scalability is also not there. These, these platforms are extremely costly. Um, they're uh, very complex mechanically, electronically, computationally, right? So if we need to have a path to be able to make, you know, hun tens, hundreds of millions of vehicles, uh, we need to have a different uh, solution for that. So Perceptive was started with this um, uh, mission um, to actually, you know, bring sense into the next generation. And so, um, a few years ago, we started and we developed this comprehensive uh, sensing platform for next generation autonomy. Yeah, and I pulled a diagram up here because I think this diagram really speaks to what you're doing. Uh, and it looks like you have multiple sensors there, LIDAR, radar, cameras. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, so the, the first sort of one of the um, core principles of Perceptive is that no single sensor can actually entirely by its own solve the sensing problem, the perception problem. Each sensor has some strengths and some uh, weaknesses, and um, we require um, redundancy in terms of uh, engineering redundancy as well as redundancy in information. Uh, so the solution, definitely at the present day, but also for, much, for a lot of time to come, we believe uh, will come from um, cooperating and complementing sensors. So that's why we have all these modalities working together. Now, the particular blend between these modalities is probably something that is not fixed in time and really depends on the different users and depends on um, the point in time that we're going to be doing this. Probably the balance between these modalities will change over time. And different people have different uses of them. But uh, we really believe that it's a common element across the entire space is that you need them all, right? To at least have the, the performance, the, you know, level four, level five performance that we all want, right? Uh, it's level two performance, level two autonomy, um, driver assistance is a completely different problem. And then the solution is different. We can talk about that. But when you're talking about true driverless autonomy, then you need to have something like this. Yeah, just to be clear, what you're talking about for level four, level five, are you know when you remove the steering wheel and basically the car drives itself, there is no option for a driver in that scenario, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So when we, we call it true driverless autonomy, when you remove the driver, you know, and uh, and it's a very different problem because at a point, you know, the product changes very much, the user case is different, the economics change, and suddenly you unlock different opportunities that when you still have the driver in the vehicles, they're not available to you. So very, very different path, right? Both legit, different time scales, but very different. And what really makes yours unique and that I saw when you were talking to Dr. Kornhauser and Fred Fishkin a couple weeks ago is that you've made these edge points passive or at least as passive as they could be. Is that, uh, you know, what, what's the motivation there? 
Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, I think it's um, twofold. As I said, capability and scalability. Um, so one is to actually have a, a, be able to reduce the complexity of the hardware. So um, a lot of the sensing operations today, they're sort of like, uh, decentralized and repeated over and over across the vehicles on these completely replicated uh, units and modules, right? Uh, each of them is in operating independently, each of them is running the same uh, and includes the same hardware. So that creates this escalating cost that creates this, you know, multi-million dollar, you know, development platforms. That they I, I would imagine it also is more uh, uh, power consumption too, right? Absolutely, yes. And plus, you're actually going and placing the entire system right there in um, in contact with the elements in the most probably challenging point in a vehicle, right? And so that's definitely, we saw that you now being a path forward for scale and also um, redundancy and robustness going forward you know, in cost, as we said. And so the idea is to actually centralize uh, a lot of the sensing functions uh, by actually having just a single central unit in the vehicle and keeping passive units all around. Uh, and we do that through optical fibers in our case, because we actually uh, are leveraging a lot of the technology uh, that's been originally uh, invented for COM for that. Um, so for telecommunications, right? For, communi yeah. for communi communi yeah. communi both optical as well as wireless. Um, and also, as I mentioned, like uh, once you actually have a single access point for all the data, uh, you can also do more things from the um, data process point of view. So now instead of making isolated and point by point decisions, you can actually have an holistic approach to things. So you can have inputs from the different modalities to actually make better, stronger, um, more uh, confident decisions about the world out there. So you can have LiDAR, radar, and cameras, for instance, actually cooperating to uh, come to a conclusion about something that is out there. Turns out when you do that, you can actually make the hardware simpler and uh, less expensive, you know, so as opposed to. Yeah. In other words, you might have in this arrow key or this arrow is supposed to be simulating like a deer coming out in front of you, but you, one sensor might detect that deer and have the other sensor focus in on it. So as you get a uh, closer resolution or closer, uh, as it gets closer to you, you can change the, the sensor, if you will. You, you can do that. Oftentimes, especially this ambiguous situation. I mean, when the signal is very clear and not ambiguous and strong, well, then one sensor can solve it by itself. But most of the time, or especially the corner cases, is when it's not clear whether there is really something out there, what it is, where it is. And so there's this ambiguity. There's enough information, but it's scattering across the modalities. And if you just looked at each of them independently, probably you will still not be able to make a decision. But when you intersect them, now actually you can make much stronger conclusions about out there. Um, and so that's the sort of like the capabilities that we're unlocking by doing the centralized concurrent sensing. That makes sense. And the reliability, of course, must be much greater just because you are centralizing it here in this, uh, you know, where the arrow's showing there. Right? Yeah, from an engineering point of view, consider that like the cabin is the safest place in a car. It actually goes through much more moderate temperature excursion. Uh, compared to, for instance, the outside of the vehicle. Uh, mechanical as well, in terms of vibration, it's a much quieter place to be in. And it, so it, that, it made sense to us to actually concentrate in the cabin if you want the most uh, um, valuable and expensive part of the sensing system. So we also thought that there was no reason to replicate them all around the vehicle. So once you keep it in the cabin, you can now share them through multiplexing. Uh, across the platform. So that brings tremendous cost savings for and reliability savings. And off camera, I think you were saying that basically you could take one laser and share it among these different. Yes, that's outputs, exactly. Right? Multiple components are like lasers also shared across the vehicle in this way. So bringing tremendous savings. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And it allows you to probably source uh, components that are much more expensive in one sense, you know, and reliable or whatever, because you are sharing them, right? Well, I think that the pressure is to save at all possible ways, especially in automotive. So, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> the margins are no big. You don't have to scr uh, skimp is what I'm saying, right? <laughs> right. The, the good thing is actually, if you, if you look at that as a data center, and if you, if you consider the central unit as you know, a data center and those as fibers, you, you can actually immediately map and bring in all the technology from, from, from comms. So you can actually use you know, lasers from comms. You can use componentry from comms. They're actually... And effectively, we have reframed the sensing problem as a communication problem. Um, and this mapping allows us to leverage all those 
you know, toolboxes and building blocks that, that you find there, like places. And you get the scale of millions and millions of things uh, being deployed in data exactly. centers elsewhere. Uh, exactly. I mean, as of now, for instance, in the way we build completely off the shelf components that you buy from catalog that are already made and mass produced, right? And they already are all kind of ultra commoditized components from the point of view. Uh, so very convenient as a start um, and definitely as a, you know, a platform for you to expand on. Well, and we, uh, you've already said it, but it's analogous to uh, kind of a, uh, a radio where you split the radio head from the antenna. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Think of like 5G and distributed sort of like remote, um, you know, com um, systems like in which the base station is separated from the antennas and oftentimes it's actually handling multiple antennas together. Um, that the approach is also yeah, similar to that. Uh, from the point of view, I think we're actually borrowing some, from areas that are of technology and markets that have been very successful in, in, in the past 20 years. So we're taking from Fibercom and from Wirelesscom that have pioneered these concepts and really ultra developed them. So if you think like what we can do today with the single optical fibers under um, transoceanic links, right? Transmitting terabits of data per second with off the shelf components, right? Um, so all that technology is available to us. And then we, we thought it was actually a very good fit for this problem. Yeah, and no, it makes a lot of sense. And from a uh, economic standpoint, any idea how this would compare to a traditional approach as far as percentage? Is it going to be 50% cheaper, 10% cheaper? Or, you know, what, what sort of numbers do you think you... Oh, it's at least an order of magnitude cheaper to begin. I mean, and there's also like opportunity to save even more from the point of view. Think like all this, like, you know, you're going from instead of having eight, 10 sensors, now you just have one, you know, that's immediately just get uh, yeah. the cost uh, from the point of view. Um, there is also an opportunity, all the technology has a very fantastic opportunity for miniaturization and integration, especially you think of like the directions in which silicon photonics is going and all like mm -hmm. developers of like uh, picks in the industry have been going. So eventually you could have the entire vehicle run by a single small photonics chip. Wow. Uh, that's what the promise is, right? Well, that's right, because on those chips, you can pull off multiple fibers, yeah. right? Yeah, and then and we're not talking about science fiction. I mean, com, telecom companies have been doing that regularly for their own, you know, backbones, for their own data centers. So right. it is not, it is stuff that is done routinely today. So it's just that it will be new for cars, but I think it will be great to actually bring it to really, really dramatic, bringing dramatic, dramatic cost savings into the space. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. And from a availability standpoint, are you out in the road at trialing it now or where are you? Yeah, yeah. so in a vehicle like that, uh, it's actually, we're based in Redwood City and we are already capable of actually operating in different driving scenarios for use, urban, um, residential, and we have a very rapid development cycle. So we actually constantly um, you know, bringing in upgrades to the system that, you know, the fact that we're leveraging exclusively off the shelf components make it also much faster for us to develop. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that has been already proven and successful. We actually get uh, really unique capabilities. And one of the also great opportunities that we shifted the problem to the software. So we actually turn what it used to be a traditional, if you want, analog sensing process. And now it's more like a shifted into this the digital space and now uh, we have the opportunity of scale the software gives you in terms of like capabilities and you know the producivity. Um, so on, on based on that that's how we've been able to improve very very really fast. So now where where do you hand off? I mean I uh, I assume you're not going to do the entire autonomous vehicle. Are you just focusing on the sensing part of it, maybe doing some fusion sensing and then passing that off or how how do they, where do you fit? So we see that as a platform, we want to enable autonomy development uh, to replace it. So we see this as a comprehensive platform on top of which people can actually develop uh, more sophisticated sensing application and fusion applications. So uh, what really matters to us is have a single point where both the user can have full control of the raw data and the algorithms. So uh, that will allow them to replace you know, the several dozens of like third party black boxes that they're currently utilizing for their um, safety critical applications, right? Uh, so we wanna give them full control of their own software and algorithm stack. So they have full visibility of what they're actually, you know, putting lives on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and from, from the point of view, we're actually providing them that platform that enables them to do all these like new uh, things with, with sensors. 
Um, it's an opportunity to, for instance, train and or do inference of AI on this raw data that contains a wealth of information that today is not available. Um, and then it's an additional opportunity to further simplify the hardware and the platform, right? A lot of the reason why data is poor today because it's captured very, very much downstream, where most, most of the information has already been lost, processed, and adulterated. Um, mm -hmm. And just because of for lack of users to be able to intercept and access data at the earlier stage in the process. With our system, they can actually come as early as the sensing interface with the real world, with the physical world, to actually get all these additional characteristics that the signal carries. They just need a really, really big hard drive, huh? <laughs> a big hard drive, you know, but if you break the problem into training and inference, so you can need a very big hard drive in your training, but you don't need it for inference uh, when you're actually, you know, deploying it in the field. Mm -hmm. in, in the same way, we, we also, like, want to let the user decide how much of the processing they want to do locally in the sensing platform versus how much they prefer doing remotely in their own unit. And again, there's probably not a single solution there, and that's a you know a degree of freedom that we will leave to the users. And so, uh, from a um, market perspective, I mean, it, it sounds like you've got the prototypes up and running. When do you expect it to be commercial? So we're scaling it now. We're actually starting to like shoot get into more vehicles in the months to come. And so we have pilot programs uh, starting later this year that will get us to you know the few tens of vehicles and gradually you know, scale it to more and more. Um, this is like a level four, level five autonomy approach. So it's like actually, um, you know, it's intercepting the roadmaps of the industry for that technology. Well, that's an interesting question. Is Are, are you going to be providing then kind of the recipe and your algorithms for people? And when I say recipe, I'm thinking a lot of these components are, are standardized, um, but, but you're not necessarily manufacturing those silicon uh, photonic, uh, you know, the diodes and stuff. So do you um, do you anticipate kind of here's the design and uh, uh, GM as an example, obviously, you know, I just threw that out there. They would take that design and then integrate it in. So uh, going from now to in, 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 the, in the future, we're going to go progressively through more and more integration. So now we still leverage a number of discrete building blocks. Some of them already include silicon photonics, but they're still discrete and dependent. As we go down the road, we start actually integrating it and bringing them more into a single comprehensive unique, unique um, hardware component. So that's something we actually want to do, uh, okay. get into the point and provide this like hardware platform with algorithms. Now the user case varies. Um, there is there are different needs, especially depends who your customers are. So OEMs, for instance, and more, um, Car makers, for instance, they're more interested in actually having turnkey solution, uh, very well tailored for very specific applications, right? In that case, usually having a well self-contained and all a thought out solution is better. Other developers actually have more, you know, need to actually get more down into the data, more control of the algorithm, sometimes so replacing completely the logic. So we provide to both of them. We, we, we offer solutions to both of them. I think it's important to kind of go into the background of you and your founders. I mean, you you have some amazing an amazing background. I know you were involved in L Ligos. Is that how you say it? The Correct, Ligo. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your founders? Uh, yeah, so I, I spent 10 years of my life going after gravitational waves. The project was definitely informational for me. Um, so you were working at the boundaries of technology, the ultimate sensitivity. It's the most sensitive um, detector in the world. So you really get to the fundamentals of physics, uh, quantum noise, thermal noise, uh, uh, you know, uh, seismic noise. So you, it doesn't get better than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it was really, very great. So you really see what's possible. Um, and then um, I worked also on a number of aerospace uh, projects, uh, some including NASA, for instance, I worked on a mission called NASA follow on, uh, Grace follow on, uh, intended to measure uh, the gravity fields around the planet, right? Using two spacecraft connected by a laser link. So uh, again, reaching and achieving like very high sensitivity in very harsh environments. So I had the background that was with me. Um, and then I worked for Apple, um, developing autonomous technology for, for a number of years um, and some of my colleagues as well. And so um, 
you know, it was a very, very interesting field, very attractive. Um, they, um, I was extremely um, fascinated by autonomy, and I thought it was a great opportunity to actually have a fresh start on sensing. I thought it was very much needed. In my tenure time, while I looked at the space, I didn't see much change. So I realized that it was very much need of, you know, changing things. Uh, and so we set off. Um, so we actually put together a really world-class team of engineers. Uh, we all and have- when, when was that, when you started this? Uh, 2008, um, middle, about two years ago. Okay. And set off. Um, yeah, it was very low budget stuff. We started like, it was first me, then two and three and four and five, and now we're eight people and, uh, <laughs> and more. Um, but, you know, we sort of like, um, you know, the, being a small team, actually coming from a trillion dollar company, and like <laughs> infinite people, infinite resources to a very, very low budget company, very few people, uh, was actually a very interesting um, experience that you had, I learned a lot from, you know, it actually brings a lot of clarity and focus and <laughs> what's important. Yeah, you have to stay focused. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, couple, triggered a couple of comments, and I wanted to ask you about lasers in outer space. But before I do that, um, aviation, do you see this uh, being uh, your technology going into the air? There's a lot of uh, un um, or driverless, if you will, <laughs> driverless airplane initiatives right now, autonomous airplanes. Obviously, there's Uber and Hyundai and so forth. Um, Bell and, and so forth. Do you see your sensor suite potentially playing into that market as well? Uh, certainly. I, I think if you think that the applications are and the user cases are different, but the fundamental problem is, is the same. They're now effectively developing um, AI applications, new, new generation robotics applications, and the old sort of like uh, sensing methodologies that we used in the past, we like at the different, um, if you want architecture, a, diff a different approach, like uh, back in the past, sensors were developed for human consumption, right? <laughs> like data was developed for completely different applications. Now uh, we're getting into the area of, you know, AI taking control of our machines, right? And AI actually sense the world in a different way. They need to have access to the world in a different way. So from the point of view, um, sort of like if you look at a big picture, that that's where we're at. So we're trying, to change the way that we actually provide uh, sensing information to AI. Um, and so um, multiple of this uh, robotics application from the avionics, you know, aerospace, um, think of like manufacturing or inspection in industrial applications. So mm -hmm. think about agriculture, um, mm -hmm. uh, shipping, tracking, all this immediately become available. I mean, robotics is gonna take over our life, but yeah. you know, robots and AI actually sense and make sense of the world in very different ways than us. Yeah, and I guess the, the thing is you need uh, 360 sensing, right? I mean, ideally, if you have 360, that helps you in all these applications, it seems. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's, it's question that it's more important to actually, um, so actually, rather than having just 360, focusing on what's important for you. Like if you mm. think of it, it's intelligence, we don't give the same attention to everything at the same time. So we actually are very much attention oriented, right? And right. you always have to, regardless of what your intelligence capabilities are, you're always gonna have finite resources and you'll always have to allocate them in the more efficient ways. And most of the information out there usually doesn't, will not change your outcomes. Right? Yeah. So you need to focus on what's important, what you you should care. Always. Yeah, I think Dr. Kornhauser says uh, it's the best thing about the human brain is the ability to forget, right? Or something like that. Exactly, exactly. So I, I, I think that's what actually autonomy learned in the past 15 years. You don't need to see every, everywhere, every time with the same resolution at the same rate, the same capabilities. I mean, you could, but if you have those resources, you could also better use them in different ways and something is right. more valuable to you. Yeah, so, no, and that makes sense because you're, you are in the other issues like power budgets and stuff like that, right? Definitely, but even like performance capabilities, you rather see a little bit further or you rather have maybe a faster refresh rate. And most of the information, you don't even have the capability or the interest process, right? Um, so it, it, it's all about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not, being that, efficient, not brute force, but being smart. 
That makes sense. And speaking of smart, uh, one of the things I've been following a little bit um, is Starlink and uh, what's going on with Elon Musk's uh, venture there. And one of the th things that seems from what I've read, they actually want to use lasers in outer space to communicate between, effectively create their own internet backhaul, but backbone in space. And it sounds like, you know, that's not an easy, easy thing to shoot lasers between satellites. I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that. Now, is it yeah, I mean, laser come is a really fascinating problem. I mean, every, the industry has been working on that for the past 30 years. There are tremendous opportunities, but also like some fundamental limitations. And, and NASA has been developing it for actually interplanetary and even extra, you know, solar system communication with spacecraft. The opportunity of bandwidth are actually unique that you don't get from from RS, from RF. So definitely, there is a lot of interest. To me, it seems like having monitored the industry and followed that scientifically and in the industry it seems that laser com will probably be complementary now to you know uh, RF com. You know, um, for instance. There are some specific applications where you know RF could actually be better, um, oh, interesting. and so uh, it it still looks like maybe the industry hasn't found uh, like a, a solution, but maybe a blend. That's what I see yeah. in the future. Well, it it is interesting because I guess those the satellites themselves probably won't be that far apart from each other, will they? I mean, I maybe hundred miles or something. Yeah, you know? Leo orbit. Um, I, I think you need to talk. I mean, there's like. Sometimes a hybrid approach where maybe the link to ground is RF and the link between mm -hmm. satellites is optical, or maybe it's all optical. That's how I understood it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm not aware exactly what the official architecture yeah, yeah. on <laughs> as, as speak for that. Um, but uh, there are definitely great opportunities in terms of bandwidth, plus, you know, the entire optical spectrum is unregulated. Um, right. So um, that is what makes it attractive. <laughs> That makes sense. Well, one thing, and I've got to ask you this question because I learned this um, many decades ago. But you know, do not look at laser with remaining good eye. Um, and I've always always wondered about that with lidar and everything else. You know, as, as soon as we have millions of cars with millions of uh, light beams shooting out, I mean, these are these are power levels that are eye safe. I I've got to think, right? Correct. Yes, actually, that's what we do particularly well because our system can actually operate at even um, significant lower power levels than, than uh, traditional systems from the point of view. So uh, plus we operate in the far infrared where it's really like a particularly uh, safer spot. <laughs> is, is part of that because you're able to spend more, I guess, if you will, uh, reconstructing the signal uh, at the uh, yeah, your central processor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we can actually operate, and because we have these significant enhancements in um, signal to noise, right, and performance, yeah. we can actually operate with, with lower signals, lower powers. And I would imagine one of the secrets, your secret sauce, has got to be at the passive device. Somehow you're steering the beam uh, through magic or some other means, I guess. Well, that is uh, not the actual just solution for regulations. You need to consider even the extreme case that think someone comes next to your car and literally sticks their eyeballs to oh, yeah. <laughs> to the window yeah. of your sensor. Yeah, so um, they're scanning your eye. Huh? <laughs> so you need to be able to actually be able to uh, be uh, eye safe so that you can withstand even a static laser beams. Um, but I was, uh, but in general, you somehow are scanning. Uh, scanning the, the we, we image the scene in our um, in our way, but um, okay. there we use different methods <laughs> from that. Yeah, that's got to be part of your secret to secret sauce, I we, guess. We have a very very unique way to actually address and interrogate this scene. Yeah, well, it's um, very exciting what you're doing. It's uh, it's really cool the way you're taking kind of standard components. And obviously, putting intelligence around them to to create a different approach to um, very important thing for autonomous vehicles and that are needed. That's needed. Yeah, thank you. I think you, we have to. I think we there's a big wall of like the laws of physics, and it's very hard to fight. You don't want to fight the laws of physics, so you need to think about uh, something that's not a brute force approach because you lose <laughs> if you try to fight <laughs> physics, right? Um, and the, the good thing is like, you don't have to, you know, uh, nature is on our side.
Yeah, I fought physics and I fell to the ground, I think. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, on that note, I really appreciate meeting you and being on the VOD View here, VOD TV, and uh, look forward to meeting you in person. I mean, actually, physically in person someday. So, Likewise, hopefully very soon, Ken. Okay.